Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. We're glad that you were here today to join us for worship. Let's stand together and sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the So it's great to have you here. We are celebrating the Lord's Supper today. We're excited about that as we remember his death, burial, and his resurrection. Um, I was shocked when I stepped outside today. I thought, what is this? Because it was such a nice day yesterday, wasn't it? I mean, oh my gosh. (sighs) Jason must have done something wrong that we're being punished. I don't know what the deal is. Um, Make sure that you stay in tune with what's going on. There's a number of ways that you can find out looking at our uh, church website, Facebook page. There's uh, announcements and stuff like that in your Bible app notes uh, on our church app and stuff like that. So um, make sure that you just stay in tune. And we have a guest speaker this morning. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but you'll know when uh, he comes in. I hope he gets here on time. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on the service. Father, we give you thanks and praise for your creative handiwork, for you holding everything in control, whether it's beautiful weather or whether it's stinky weather, you are the weatherman. And for that, we give you thanks, for your ways are perfect. We pray that you pour out your spirit upon this service, that all will be done for the glory of Jesus in whose name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing, praise you anywhere. From the lion's 
your neighbor this morning, greet them in the Lord today.
Remember I said there's a guest speaker today? But he'll bring it. Does anyone have a word of praise they would like to declare? Is it on? Okay. Um, so this past week has been really rough for Whirlpool, and um, Daniel and I are both very fortunate that we were not part of the layoffs, and so we both still are employed, which was very stressful and a really just hard time overall. Um, and many people that we know and have worked with for a long time were not as fortunate. Mm -hmm. And so that's been hard. Um, and then I just want to brag on my youngest, Nolan, for a minute, because he's been working so hard, and things are so much better than where they were. And you know, through the loveliness that is Facebook memories, I can see how bad things were last year. And it, we're just so far from that right now. And that is something to praise God for. Amen. Do it. All right. uh, I've got a couple this week. Um, first of all, thankful that my mother was able to come visit. She's got to keep an eye on you. What's that? She's got to keep an eye on you. Of course. And praise God for a a prayer and a need that I've been praying on for decades, gosh, even, and finally came to fruition this week. So praise God for that. Amen. Beth? He always volunteers me to talk. <laughs> so Anna graduated this weekend, yeah. which is huge. <laughs> she should have graduated a year and a half ago, but that's okay because she finally did it. And she got accepted into her graduate school for her doctorate. Wow, Woo. yeah. <laughs> and she was one-tenth, no, one-hundredth of a point away from Kumasum Laude or whatever that is, which is huge because she doesn't remember things very easily, so that took a lot of work for her to get there. And then the school recognized her for a scholarship for people who have persevered and succeeded through adversity. And so she got a great, um, actually, monetary scholarship for that and a plaque, nice. so that's going to help for school. So it's fabulous so thank you all for your prayers her health is okay right now but um she's persevering and she's doing well and then she just got her internship with a doctor in zealand for the summer so she'll be here all summer doing doctor things while she's um, working in zealand so super fabulous thing and then um you don't celebrate a funeral, but we went to a funeral yesterday, and it was a very moving funeral because the person who was, I don't know if he was a pastor or from their church or what, it was, it was at the senior center, and he asked all the people in the room to raise their hand if the person who had passed away had ever um, ministered to them, you know, and talked to them about Christ, and over half the room raised their hand, and then he said, well, how many of you came to Christ because of him? And probably three-fourths of the original people who had raised their hands raised their hand again, mm -hmm. and that is definitely a cause for celebration. Mm -hmm. um, he touched so many lives that we didn't even know. We just knew him from Bumbleberry, but um, he has changed so many lives. And so while it's sad to see him go, he went out 
with a blaze of glory, and he is celebrating, and all those people get to see him again, so that was fabulous. So that was part of our week. <laughs> So I had something happen to me this morning that has never happened. Oh, go ahead, Vasha. I'll, tell, I'll talk later. Okay, we are to praise God in all situations. Yeah. Most of you know that we lost our granddaughter last week, last Thursday evening. She had a heart rupture, ran into a tree, and passed away. And so I want to thank all of you for your prayers and just thank the Lord for all of the, our brothers and sisters in Christ here and elsewhere. And keep us in your prayers. It's a pretty hard knock. We're still trying to get over the initial shock of the whole thing. So thank you all for your prayers. I'll give you a microphone, but you have to talk into it, and you can't wave at me with it. I, I just want prayer for my family. We are still waiting for Vincent for surgery, and the problem seemed to be Borges is over, overloaded. But what I'm nervous about is have something to do with the blood flow. And we don't want any, him to lose any more fingers or anything. So that, just pray that the Lord will move things so that we can get him in. And then I had a loss yesterday. Mm -hmm. He was just like a son to, to me. Um, he was crazy about my husband and the two of them was almost like twins. And the funniest part is Paul, he passed away early on a Saturday morning, and he did the same thing yesterday morning, like almost the same time, like Paul had passed. And I won't be able to go to the funeral, but just pray for the family, you know. Um, they, he, he bought it, you met the family, the son played the keyboard, and the daughter sang at mm. Paul's funeral. And they are really, he really raised up a good family because those boys, he had four boys and a girl, and you, you can see the closeness in the different things that they do, and they'd do anything for you. Right away, the son gonna call me and just make sure I'm okay, you know? And then I said, well, how's your mother doing, mm -hmm. you know? And he said, well, she done, she okay, but everybody wondering how you doing, you know? So just pray for the family and pray that we can get Vincent in and out so we can get him going on the right foot. Thank you. I didn't catch the last part. They so cut you. Okay. Okay. Yes, you did good. Father, we just bring before you Vincent at this time and just pray, Father, that you move things along so we can get the surgery that he needs. We thank you for him. We thank you for Miriam and pray that you will give comfort and peace uh, to the family that had lost loved ones. And uh, knowing that they're in your presence is, is a reason to rejoice. And so we thank you for her and for her family in Jesus' name. Amen. So real quickly, this morning, I, um, usually about 815, I open up the doors, you know, unlock that so that Gabe can make it in, you know, if he didn't oversleep. And um, <laughs> that way, you know, you wouldn't have to ring the doorbell. But the doorbell rang, and I thought, who's that? And then it rang twice. Obviously, some didn't know I got to go from that end of the building over to this end, you know. I mean, it's not like I'm standing out the door waiting to get in. And here's this guy. He had a coat on, looked kind of scruffy. Um, didn't smell the best, had a big honking backpack on him, and I didn't know if this is, you know, a, a homeless person or whatever it is, and I opened the door, you know, can I help you thinking, you know, he's going to want a meal or something else like that, and he said, can I just come in and pray for a moment? Okay. 
So I let him come in. He takes off his backpack and I said, where's your sanctuary? I said, it's right in through there, through the doors. You know, it's dark, kind of nice for him and everything else like that. He went inside to pray and I'm thinking, hmm. A little cynical person that I can sometimes be, I'm thinking, is he going to come out with a revolver? What's he doing in the sanctuary? Is he planting a bomb under one of the pews? What's the deal, right? So I thought, oh, I just better stay by the welcome table. And then after a couple minutes, he comes out, says thanks, puts on his backpack, and heads down the road. Never had that happen before. I guess I felt pretty safe. You know, if it's my time to go, it's my time to go. But how can, how can you turn down someone says, hey, can I come into your church and pray? No! <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, praise God. Let's stand and sing together, Great and Mighty King.
may have a seat this morning. Good morning. Well, you guys get the benefit of what God laid on my heart this morning, being encouraging. Uh, this, this should be a message of encouragement to you. Or you get the benefit of the fact that I was up at the butt crack. At, it's a bap, I forgot where baps. Can I say butt in here? Right. I was up early. <laughs> <laughs> So as some of you know or don't know, um, we are uh, missionaries uh, for First Baptist Church. Uh, you guys do support us in our work out at Truvine. And that is actually why my better half and my kids are not here with me today. Um, they actually had a horse show this morning in Allegan um, that they're representing Truvine at. And it's important for us to be in on some of those things to maintain our standing with the horse community. Um, so you do get the benefit of my boots. I still got my boots on. Hopefully, um, well, there might be a little bit of manure on them. I don't, I don't know. So if it smells too bad, feel free to move back one. It shouldn't, it'll just be for a little while. <clears throat> but I had an energy drink this morning because there was no Big B on the way to the fairgrounds in Allegan. But then there was Big B on the way in here. So I'm going to stop by there too. So this, this should be good. Tracy, you got one job. If I'm talking too fast because I'm hyped up on caffeine, go like this. Okay? All right. So this morning, as you can see, I'm taking Jerry's spot for the week. I'm sorry. I know that sense of disappointment that you have inside you. It's the same one I get whenever he's not here. No offense, Jason. I can only equate it. I know this didn't happen this year, but you, you know we had the NFL draft recently. If you've watched it all, J.J. McCarthy went to the Vikings, you know. That's all I really cared, cared about, but you got the NFL draft, and I, I just imagine myself as this professional football player, super good, super talented, sitting there, getting ready to get drafted in the first round, and you see, uh-oh, I'm only a couple of spots away from the Lions. They're going to draft me. Isn't this great? And next thing you know, the stinking bears trade their way up and steal you from the lions. I can only imagine that's the same disappointment that you feel right now. <laughs> All right, so this morning we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. And if you want to turn there with me, feel free. Or you can use your phone, the Bible app on your phone. Either one, and a smart preacher would have uh, bookmarked his spot here, but I didn't. So I'll give you time to get there, all right? Well, I'm glad you could make it this morning. I know yesterday was a beautiful day, and I didn't even want to come inside yesterday. But I'm glad to see that you guys didn't waste all your day outside, get sunburnt to death and couldn't make it today. So we're all here. So that's a good thing. Um, and I hope that you find this message this morning a sense of encouragement uh, in times of trouble. It's always important. Can you just pretend like you're not Baptist for one minute? And if you're in the theology class right now that's going on, just raise your hand real quick. A couple of you. All right. Awesome. So as you're working your way through that theology class, what an amazing class that is to teach you how to study the Bible, about the Bible, and it, I, I took it, it was, it was awesome, and I'm so glad that so many of you are in it. One of the things that you're going to learn is it's important not to take verses out of context, right? What do they call that? Eisegeting? Is that correct? Exegeting is where you let the scripture speak for itself. All right, so that's what we want to do here today. So in order to do that, we need to take 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16 and put it into context, into the context in which it lies. So in order to do that, we want to put it in the context of the rest of the chapter. Now, if you go back to the very beginning of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, can anybody tell me the first word that you see there? Therefore, right? Therefore, I had a very wise man growing up that told me any time you see, you see therefore in the Bible, you need to do one thing, and that's figure out what it's, 
therefore. Exactly right. So in order to do that, we're going to go back another chapter to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Oh, I forgot. You told me I had to flick it on too. All right. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown about what that uh, chapter is about. So the chapter can kind of be broken down into five different sections based on the verses. In verses 1 through 3, Paul begins by addressing a question that uh, he needs a letter of recommendation for his apostolic ministry. And he suggests that the Corinthians themselves are his letter of recommendation, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. This signifies the transformative effect of the gospel, which is evident in the lives of believers, surpassing the need for external validation. So that's kind of verses 1 through 3 in there. And verses 4 through 6, Paul speaks of the confidence he has through Christ before God, not because of his own ability, but because his competence comes from God. He contrasts the letter of the law, which kills, with the spirit, which gives life. This underscores the idea that the new covenant is based on the spirit, brings life and transformation unlike the old covenant based on the law, which without the Spirit could not impart life. So you have, the, you have the old covenant and the new covenant. And just briefly, the old covenant would have been the law that uh, Moses received on Mount Sinai, the, the written in stone tablets, the, the Ten Commandments. We all know those. And the new covenant is the covenant that we see in the New Testament with Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Verses 7 through 11 of chapter 3, Paul discusses the glory of the ministry of the Old Covenant, which was so glorious that the Israelites couldn't gaze at Moses' face because of his brightness. Yet he argues that the ministry of the Spirit, or the New Covenant, is even more glorious. The Old Covenant, which brought condemnation, had glory, but the New Covenant, which brings righteousness, surpasses it in glory. This comparison highlights the superiority of the new covenant in terms of its life-giving and transformative power. In verses 12 through 16, Paul uses the metaphor of Moses veiling his face to explain how the Israelites' minds were hardened. In the same way, he suggests that whenever the old covenant is read, a veil covers their hearts, preventing them from understanding the full revelation of God. However, in Christ, that veil has been removed allowing believers to see and understand the glory of God. This signifies the revelation and understanding that comes through Christ in the new covenant. And then lastly, verses 17 and 18 in that chapter, Paul concludes with one of the most profound statements in the New Testament, and it is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Paul describes believers as those who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. And that glory comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This reflects the transformative power of the Spirit under the new covenant, enabling believers to become more like Christ. Throughout 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul contrasts the old and the new covenants, emphasizing the surpassing glory and transformative power of the new covenant established through Christ and enacted by the Spirit. The chapter is a deep reflection on the nature of Christian ministry and its transformative effect. Therefore, oh, sorry, I'm not keeping up with my own slides. Therefore, we get to chapter 4. And just a a brief run through of that before we get to our our, our verse. Um, In verses 1 and 2, Paul begins by addressing the character of his ministry. He talks about not losing heart, renouncing secret and shameful ways. Because remember in chapter 3, he was teaching about the new covenant and not the old covenant and the law that he has to abide by. This reflects his commitment to conducting his ministry with transparency and integrity and avoiding deceit and manipulation. Verses 3 and 4 Paul acknowledges that the gospel is veiled to some who are perishing. He attributes this in part to the God of the age, which is a reference to Satan, who has blinded the minds of unbelievers. This highlights the spiritual battle 
and the fact that the acceptance of the gospel involves spiritual enlightenment beyond mere human persuasion. I was just talking to Brandy. Um, I, it was either this week or last week. I can't remember. And we, one of the things that we do out at Truvine is every time we bring kids out to ride horses, we share the gospel with them. That's been my focus of the ministry in everything we do there. I'm like, I don't care what riding looks like. I don't care what instructors we have. I don't care what horses we have. Those kids are going to hear the gospel, period. And she, she was like, I don't know how you do that. And I was like, I, I, we're talking through this. She goes, I've never felt that comfortable in sharing my faith with somebody. I've never felt comfortable witnessing to people. And she brought up several examples. Throughout my life, God has placed people in my life, complete strangers a lot of times, that were in need or had something going on. And I felt the urge to help them and share the gospel with them at the same time. And some of them got saved, some of them didn't. And I told her, I said, I don't know what it is exactly that make, gives me the boldness to be able to do that, other than I feel like it's my calling, and my gift to do that. So I do it. And I, I said, I think the comfort that I get in being able to do that without fear comes from this right here. And knowing that somebody's, somebody changing their life and committing their life to Christ has nothing to do with me. I am just the mouthpiece that's sharing the gospel. That heart decision that they make to choose to follow Christ has nothing to do, I could say all the wrong words in all the wrong ways. And if the Holy Spirit opens their heart to the call of the gospel, they're going to get saved. And if he doesn't, they're not. It doesn't matter how well I presented something. It doesn't matter if I said the right words. It, I could have the best presentation in the world and they could turn around and walk away and it wouldn't matter because it takes an act outside of human persuasion. It is the call of the gospel and the Holy Spirit opens that heart. And I said, honey, I think I just early on caught on to that and I was like, I, I can do this without fear. I can do this without the fear of rejection and somebody walks away and didn't get saved. It's not on me. I, I don't need to take that personally. I'll let the Holy Spirit do the work. Anyways, that was a rabbit trail. Sorry. Verses 5 and 6 in chapter 4 here, Paul emphasizes that his preaching is not about himself, but it's about Jesus Christ as Lord. He speaks of the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in Christ, indicating that Christ is the ultimate revelation of God. Verses 7 through 12 a significant theme in this chapter is the paradox of power and weakness. And you see that here in verses 7 through 12. Paul describes himself and the other apostles as jars of clay. It's a metaphor indicating that he's fragile and humble. It's to show that all surpassing power is from God and not from them. His discussion of enduring hardships and persecution highlights the resilience and sustaining power of God in the midst of human weakness. I mean, just think of what he's using as a metaphor, a jar of clay. What happens when you drop, drop a jar of clay? I can make the noise. <laughs> My favorite noise is when you play Zelda. And you get to go in and you get to whack all those jars of clay. Where, where are my video gamers at? Oh, yeah. <laughs> all the time, man. I'm constantly whacking clay jars. It's awesome. Um, in verses 13 through 15, Paul speaks about the spirit of faith and his confidence in the resurrection. He ties the suffering of the apostles and their steadfast faith, faith to the benefit of the church and the glory of God, emphasizing that their struggles lead to grace that reaches more people and results in thanksgiving to God. And then the last two verses, three verses, 16 through 18, uh, the chapter concludes with a powerful statement about not losing heart. While Paul acknowledges that outward decline or suffering, he contrasts this with the inner renewal that happens day by day. He encourages looking not at the seen, which is temporary, but at the unseen, which is eternal. This reflects a deep, eternal perspective, focusing on the glory that far outweighs the troubles of the present time. So we can stop right there, and I 
we could send you home, but I feel like you wouldn't have gotten your money's worth, so we're going to keep going. So let's go to our verse now. 2 Corinthians 4.16. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. The first part of that verse is, so we don't lose heart. Paul is actually tying back to the first verse in this chapter, where he says, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we don't lose heart. Paul's talking about God bringing glory to himself, even through his weaknesses and discouragements. And I mean, if we were to take a brief look at Paul's ministry, it was full of weakness and discouragement. And you don't need to look these up. I just put them up there for reference. If you ever want to look them up later, this is where I got the information from. Um, Paul's ministry started (laughs) before he was even a Christian. You know, Paul's name was Saul prior to becoming Paul, right? And he was known as the persecutor of Christians. Um, (laughs) He zealously, it said he zealously persecuted Christians in the Christian church. He was complicit in their imprisonment and death. Paul struggled with sin. In Romans, he talks about his personal struggle with sin, acknowledging his human fragilities and tendencies towards wrongdoing, despite his desire to do good. Something I can definitely relate to. Oh, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. He also talks about the thorn in the flesh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, and I've heard many, many pastors speak on this, and despite their opinions, this, is, this does not mean Paul was married. I can only say that because Brandy's not here. <laughs> it's absolutely not true. Paul speaks of his thorn in this, this thorn in the flesh that tormented him. This weakness, whatever it was, remained with him despite his prayers for removal. Paul had conflict with people that he worked with, with Barnabas specifically. They had a disagreement over John Mark, which actually, actually led to them parting ways. Um, he talks about having physical weakness and illness, uh, which was a trial for him, and, made, and it was a big concern for the Galatian church. He's perceived as a poor speaker. Uh, Paul acknowledges that he's not considered a strong public speaker, which is definitely a potential weakness in his ministry in the time that he was doing it, because in a Roman culture, they valued elegance and culture. He talks about having endured hardships, including beatings, stonings, shipwrecks, imprisonments. These experiences were testifying to his resilience. He's criticized for his appearance. Uh, Paul mentions criticism regarding his physical appearance and presence, possibly uh, indicating a lack of the commanding persona that would be expected of a leader of his stature. Uh, He was dependent on others. You know, Paul often relied on the support and hospitality of other believers for his missionary journeys. He had contentions with authorities. Paul dealt with conflict and disagreements within the early church, and also with leadership, both Jewish and Roman leadership. Oftentimes, this contention with authority led to his arrest or imprisonment. He had internal church conflicts, uh, including issues of doctrine and practice, and it, it really underscores the challenge of maintaining unity and handling dissent within the early church. And then he also had feelings of inadequacy, Paul expressed feelings of unworthiness and inadequacy, particularly regarding his role as an apostle due to his past as a persecutor of the church. I, that's a short list. But of all the examples to use, and still Paul can sit there and say, so we don't lose heart. That's the part that speaks to me. We have a great record of what Paul's life was and what what happened, what he was before he was a Christian, what happened to him as a Christian. And if he can go through these things and say, so we don't lose heart, I 
think maybe I can too. So the second part of that verse is, though our outer self is wasting away. Here, Paul's contrasting the physical reality with the spiritual. The outwardly wasting away refers to a physical, physical decline or hardships faced, possibly due to age, persecution, or other struggles. Have you ever felt your outer self wasting away? I know I have. Um, it's, we're a while separated now, but I thought it was still a relevant example. I, I fall into the same trap as everybody else. Every new year, I got to come up with something that I'm going to focus on, right? And I'm pretty sure every new year, it's the same thing. Like this year, I want to be healthier. I'm going to eat healthier. I want to start working out. I'm going to lose weight. It's going to be a good year. I was thinking back this year over my life as I'm making this decision to lose weight, which obviously hasn't happened. Um, and a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, um, I had just graduated basic training in the Army. And I remember what my physique was like back then. I was probably in the best shape of my life. Not probably, I was in the best shape of my life. Um, I had the beginnings of a six-pack. It, 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 it shadowed, all right? If the lighting was right, you could... Okay. <laughs> I remember when I first got home, um, I would go out at night after, after work. I'd go to work all day, and I'd come home at night, and it was nothing for me to go out and run a 5K multiple nights a week. Just no problem. It was a piece of cake. I even signed up for one of those Tough Mudder things. You know what those are? It's like a half a marathon that you run, but every, I don't know, mile or whatever it is, they got some crazy obstacle that you got to go over, under, or crawl through, through some sort of mud, right? And I trained for it. I, ahead of time, me and a buddy and Brandy did it, and uh, we all trained ahead of time. But what's sad is I probably didn't even have to. I was in that good of shape. And now, here I am, dragging every morning to get up, unable to function without coffee, tired all the time, losing hair, gaining weight. <clears throat> I was sitting on the couch the other night, hungry, thinking about how hungry I was, but I was too lazy to get up and do anything about it. <laughs> and I was just like, oh man, the fall from glory. It's gone. In fact, I was working, um, it's been a couple months now, but I, I did a side project with a friend, and we were remodeling a bathroom for some people. And I was like, oh, yeah, man, like, i grown up in the building business. I can do this. I, we built our house. It's a piece of cake, you know, nothing, nothing to it. And all I could think about after working and then going there in the evenings and on the weekends and stuff and doing that is how bad my body hurt. <laughs> my back hurt, <laughs> my knees hurt, and how hard it was to roll out of bed in the morning. I'd gotten to that point in life where I can still work out. I, I can still, I'm physically capable of doing it. And I get sore. The problem now is it's not my muscles that get sore, it's my joints <laughs> that get sore. I can literally feel my outer self wasting away. And I'm sure there's some of you that can relate to that. There's probably some that can't. But maybe it's not sore muscles or achy joints. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe it's heart disease. Maybe it's diabetes or arthritis. And we all know how painful that can be. Maybe you're just frustrated with your appearance, like I am. You got lumps in all the wrong places. You got sagging skin. Whatever it is, you can feel your outer self wasting away. And it's not exclusive to physical ailments either. Have you ever had things happen to you that just flat beat you down? Have you had a boss at work that's an absolute tyrant and there's nothing you can do to make them happy? Kim? No. 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. How about losing a loved one? Struggles raising your kids? Marriage problems. And that'll leave you feeling beat down. Like you're going to waste away into nothing. Maybe you lost your job. Whatever it is. Have you ever been standing at the grocery store with a cart full of groceries only to have your debit card declined? That's rough. You know, Brandy and I have been in the ministry for a while. And unfortunately, ministry positions don't always pay the best. And living in our country, you have to have money to survive. It just is what it is. And we've had times where we've gone with reduced or limited paychecks or missed paychecks even. Um, And I can tell you from experience, when you're sitting there with no money, your bank account's empty, you need to get groceries, gas in the car, pay your mortgage, you can feel your outer self wasting away. And if you do what I do, I always look to myself to fix the problem, right? I, the, the famous theological statement, God helps those who help themselves. It's not true. <laughs> That's folk theology. I'd start considering donating blood for that $20 gift card and then turning right around and going to get plasma for the $100 new offer, right? And I heard at one time, like, kidneys were worth 100 grand, and I got two of them, so I might as well give one of those up, right? I, having been there and gone through it, I can tell you, it's rough. And if you let it, it'll take years off of your life. We're going to pretend, again, that we're not Baptists. And we're going to do something different, all right? So hang in there with me. We're going to take one minute. It's going to feel like one hour. And we're going to sit in silence. You can look around. You can play on your phone. You can bow your heads and close your eyes. doesn't matter. Take a minute. One minute. I'll watch the clock. Don't doubt me. And I want you to think of what it is in your life that's causing your outer self to waste away. All right? So we're going to take one minute. Ready? Go. All right, it's amazing how long a minute can feel when you're just sitting there thinking in silence. Now that you have your list, maybe it's one thing, maybe it's a hundred things. I, sometimes my, my list grows and shrinks day by day. I want you to notice something in this verse, and that's the first word. It's though, though our outer self is wasting away. Notice what it's not. It's not if or this might be It's though our outer self is wasting. Paul knew this was going to happen. It wasn't a possibility. He said, this is going to happen to you. I know from experience, we're all going to go through this. If there's one thing I can guarantee you about our shared experience on this earth, it's that you're going to go through difficult times. But Paul ends this statement with, our inner self is being renewed day by day. What a beautiful picture. 
inwardly being renewed day by day. It's this idea of spiritual growth and strengthening despite your external circumstances. This verse should be an encouragement to us. It suggests that even though we may face physical decline or sufferings, our spiritual life can continue to flourish. It's an invitation to focus not just on the physical or present hardships, but on the ongoing spiritual development and keep an eternal perspective. And notice in the middle there, it says being renewed. It's not something you have to do. It's not something that I can just buckle down and try harder and I'm going to renew myself. You are being renewed day by day. And this is an idea that most theologians would refer to as sanctification. I know it's a big theological word. It's all right. We're going to be okay. Sanctification is simply defined as the action of making or declaring something holy. Nothing, nothing to it. We can all grasp that. There's kind of three different parts to sanctification. One is the initial sanctification, right? It's the aspect is often associated with the act of becoming a Christian. At the point of conversion, a believer is set apart by God, declared holy through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then you go into progressive sanctification. This is the ongoing process in a believer's life where they are gradually being made more like Christ. It involves the Holy Spirit's work in the believer, enabling them to grow in holiness, moral purity, and spiritual maturity. This process includes growing in virtues and overcoming sin and increasingly reflecting the character of Christ in one's life. And then the third part is complete or ultimate sanctification. This aspect of sanctification refers to the believer's final state of holiness to be realized in the afterlife. It's the completion of the sanctification process where believers are freed from all sin and imperfection. And it is often associated with the believer's future glorification in heaven. So what Paul is referring to here is the idea of progressive sanctification. The Holy Spirit is actively working in our lives to renew us day by day. Paul's showing the contrast between what happens to us outwardly and how it breaks us down and destroys us, and what the Holy Spirit is doing to us inwardly and how it builds us up and makes us into something stronger and better. Or, like Webster defines renew, to restore to freshness, vigor, or perfection. And then the last one is day by day. Oops, sorry. The last part is day by day. The concept of being renewed day by day implies that it's a continual process. It suggests that spiritual growth and renewal are ongoing. It's not a one-time event. The daily renewal can be as transform a transformative process guided by faith and perseverance. Ultimately, this verse is a message of hope and perseverance. Despite the challenges, there's a message of not losing heart, which means continuing in faith and trust in God's promises, focusing on the unseen rather than the seen, because the unseen is eternal and the seen is temporary. I don't know where you're at in life, you may, may not be going through anything right now. And if that's the case, I'm happy for you. I really am. Know that it probably won't last. We all go through hard times. It's going to happen to you. Even if you're in a good spot, know that the Holy Spirit's still renewing you day by day. And he's drawing you closer to him and making you more like Christ. And you can see it if you look for it. Sometimes in my life, I've seen it when God provides in ways that we didn't see coming. 
That could be money. It could be transportation. It could be any number of things. But we've all had those things that just come out of the blue, and you're like, wow, I did not see that coming. But God knew what you needed when you needed it. Or maybe it's in the way that verse of the day pops out. I know I get them on my phone too and I read them, right? They pop up and then you're like, holy cow, that's just exactly what I needed today. That's exactly what I'm going through today. Don't think that was by accident. Paul closes out this chapter by telling us to keep our focus off of momentary afflictions and on the things of eternal weight. And by doing that, that will keep you actively engaged in the process of daily renewal. Now, maybe you're sitting there and life stinks right now. Maybe you did something that completely blew up your life. Or maybe you didn't. Maybe something happened to you that blew up your life. Remember what we talked about earlier? This is going to happen. It's going to happen to everybody. And sometimes those things are outside of your control. Maybe you're thinking, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how I'm supposed to deal with this right now. I don't know if I can make it through this. I've been there. But know this. In our weakness, God is glorified. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6 tells us, Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You can trust that God's going to be there for you in every circumstance. Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. And I'm sure, sure that some of you are like me in this, and it's easier for some of us than others. This is something that I struggle with. I struggle with not just buckling down and doing my own thing and trusting that God has given me a brain and a will and a desire and ability to fix this myself. And while those are all good things and God has given me those things and abilities to do things, at the end of the day, I still come back to this. I need to trust that God is in control and that he is actively engaged in the process of renewing me day by day. And even if things don't go my way and even if I continue to struggle, I can find comfort in the fact that the Holy Spirit's got this. The best advice I can give you comes from the chorus of Bill Withers' song. Nobody's singing it yet? Lean on me when you're not strong, and I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on. Just pretend for a second that that's God singing it to you. We're going to do one more thing before, before we do communion. Um, and again, we're going to have to pretend like we're not Baptists. Uh, it, it was something I spoke at another church, and, and it was something that they do uh, weekly, and I found really beneficial, really kind of spoke to my heart, and I want to try it here. So... Tend you're not Baptist, get your Pentecostal spirit on for just a minute, and we're going to give a blessing. So if you would, stand for me, and you can, you can do whatever you want. You can stand, you can hold your hands out, you can receive, you can close your eyes, you can do nothing, but I'm just going to pray a blessing over you. And when we're done, you can just sit right back down, and uh, Jerry's going to come up and do communion. So um, I pray that you're blessed in good times and in bad times. I pray that you're blessed in the highs and the lows. I pray that in all those circumstances, you would see the Holy Spirit at work in your life, constantly drawing you closer to him. And I also pray James chapter 1, verse 12 over you. 
Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Thanks. You can have a seat. a little reflective, you know, kind of glare. <laughs> so we're celebrating the Lord's Supper this morning, remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if there was ever a visual representation of why we should not lose heart, this is it. This is it. Jesus provided a way for us to have our sins forgiven, the wrath of God turned away, and for us to have fellowship with him, not only in the here and now, but forever, for time without end. He sealed that promise, that covenant, with his blood. He conquered death with his resurrection, and he's coming back again. Even Baptists can say, (laughs) woo-hoo. So I'm going to invite you, we're going to skip prayer time, Linda, you know. I'm going to invite you to stand, come out of your seat, come forward, uh, take the elements, bring them back to your seat, and we will partake of those together.
So partaking of communion, we remember something that Jesus had already done, something that he had secured for us. So when he says, do this in remembrance of me, we do that remembering he had completed this for us. But it's still a physical, tangible way uh, to remind me, you know, this is, this is just as important, just as practical. If we were one of the 12 sitting around the table with him, would you stand with me and declare the word of God? And when he had taken some bread, he blessed it and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat. And during that celebration, Jesus took a cup of red wine that looked a lot like human blood. And he appealed to their knowledge of the Scripture, knowing that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And he's not going to offer up lamb or rams or goats or anything else. He's going to offer up himself. His shed blood will cover our sin. So no wonder why he said, when you take this, do this in remembrance of me. Again, join with me. In the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten and gave thanks. He said, this cup which is poured out for you, for many, for forgiveness of sin, is the new covenant in my blood which he will keep. Let's drink. This is, uh, again, the first Sunday of the month following... Uh, the conclusion of the service, uh, there's a basket in the back that we take up a benevolent offering for the first, during the first Sunday of the month. Uh, if you'd like to contribute to help the needs of those who are in need, that would be tremendous. Uh, pray God's blessing upon you for your generosity. But let's unite our hearts and our voices one last time by declaring to God how awesome his name is. Let's sing your name. Let 
If you are in Christ, do not lose heart. God bless you. You're dismissed. Go live out your faith.